your following message from Redbud Baptist Church. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas. We have two worship services on Sunday, 9 a.m. worship traditional, which is called Traditions, and then a more modern worship at 1111 a.m., which you like to call Bridge. Join us anytime. We're a growing church, growing disciples. Enjoy the message. You guys may be seated. Been standing a long time today, huh? <laughs> How do we get here? Um, Thursday night, the pastor call, uh, texted us and let us know that um, he had this long list of family members that were sick. I think one did have COVID, and the rest had flu, including Sylvia. And at the moment, he wasn't feeling too good either. So he uh, was texting me and, and I guess Gershom as well and Shane and saying, hey, look, James, can you do the early service? Shane, can you do the later service? Because just be prepared for that just in case. And, of course, the next day it was even worse, so we knew that we'd be up here without the pastor. So be praying for the entire family and that they all get better and be praying for all those that have COVID. We seem to have another round of that coming through. But I'm glad that you guys decided to come out this morning. And those of you that are online, usually I get a chance online to say, hey, uh, I'm glad you're here to worship, and I am. But um, I had to be up here instead of on the computer at that moment. And um, I'm just so glad. But obviously I got the short stick to preach now, and, and he got the long strip, so he got to sing. Praise the Lord for that, because if I had to sing for you guys, there'd be no one in this church, and <laughs> no one in the church. Online would be zero if I had to sing, so I'm glad you guys all decided to come out and be a part of this. I'm glad Shane decided to lead the worship, him and Warren, of course, and uh, I'm glad that um, everybody else, you know, is online right now, that you guys are safe and tuning in to this message, and it's the Lord's message because, like always, you know, you start preparing messages just in case you get an opportunity to jump in the pulpit and preach. And then the Holy Spirit says, no, I want you to preach on this passage and say this word. And so that usually happens somewhere along there. And I'm always excited about that, too, because I'm just excited to see what the Lord's going to bring, just as much as um, anyone else would be who's out in the audience right now and wondering what we're going to be preaching about. When we start a new year, we always think about new things, new starts and stuff like that. And I really don't want to take the pastor's thought process as to what he wants this year to be focused on. But I don't have to do that. He's, got, he's been telling you guys that for weeks now. Whether it's been here in the pulpit or Wednesday night, he's been talking about three things. Prayer, focus on that. Evangelism, we need to be focusing on that. And then discipleship, we need to be focusing there as well. And of course with evangelism, he's also talked about at, outreach as well. And so I'm not hiding anything or telling or not telling anything about what he wants us to be talking about this year and focusing on this year. He's already told us that. So if you go ahead and grab your Bibles, we'll get into the word. We're going to be in Acts chapter 5, verses 25 through 33. Acts chapter 5, verses 25 to 33. And guys, I want to say Happy New Year to you. Um, it's just such a great time of year to start anew. And we have every opportunity every day to start anew as Christians as well. The Lord is gracious. He is forgiving. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 25. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must... Obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on the tree. God exalted him to his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance 
to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnessed, witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, just allow the Spirit to lead this message today. Let us take home the things we need to take home and let us spread to others the things we need to spread about Jesus to others. Bless it for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may go ahead and sit down. Of course, when they heard this, <laughs> you know, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. The early Christians went on sharing the love of God everywhere. And this history is recorded in the Bible, guys. And it's an exciting history. Acts 5 is part of this exciting history. The followers of Jesus Christ have been telling of God's love. And they were in prison for that. He was telling them about God died for them. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. For telling the Christ came out of the grave. And I want to live too. And I want to give you eternal life as well. Is what Jesus says. And that's what they're preaching. And for saying that, they were put into jail. What a dirty, subversive, criminal thing for them to do. Talking about the love of Jesus, and that's why you find yourself in jail. In the middle of the night, it says, the Lord came and opened the door to the jail, and they escaped. Now, what do we do? They said to escape, right? That's when we pack all our bags, right? We pack all our clothes up. We get a bus ticket. We load the back, the, you know, the truck, whatever, and we get out of town. We move. We hightail it out, right? But what does it tell them they did? What did the angel tell? Go back to the same place you got arrested and say the same things that got you arrested. He must think this is a pretty, message, pretty important message for those things that he said. Because he was sending them back to the same place that they got arrested. Now, they got arrested again. Now, I, I think this whole thing's kind of funny because these guys are coming together. The Sanhedrin, the council are coming together, all right? They're going to be doing the sacrifices and everything like that, but they're going to talk to the people that they put in the jail, right? Go get the guys out of jail. We're, we need to tell them what they did. We need to accuse them of what they've done. And, of course, they go. The jail is empty. The guards are still there. The jail is empty. Okay, so that's bad enough. But by the time he's coming back, or whoever is coming back to tell him, hey, these guys are gone, there's another person that's coming in and already telling them, but they're right there in the temple, right where they were before, and they're saying the same things they were before. It's almost a comedy situation here for me when I read that the first time. But really, what else is he going to be telling them to do except for the most important thing that they should be doing? We read in verse 28, it says, saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in his name or in this name, Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And then Peter answered them, we must obey God rather than man. The message that God told him to put out there was of the Savior. Now, they could have been you know, leaders that were upset for a bunch of things. I mean, there's so much stuff on this, we could have preached on many things. It could have been because they felt like their authority was being taken away by Jesus because he's the one that becomes the sacrifices. He's the one that took their job, if you will, because that's not needed anymore. It could be because they're losing their popularity now, right? The people aren't coming to them for these things that they need to talk about. In fact, it sounds like the apostles and, and the Christian community at that time were meeting there in the temple consistently and meeting and getting together. And people loved them. Now, they, they, were, they didn't necessarily join the apostles necessarily, but they weren't upset at the apostles either because what they were doing was incredible. In fact, these things mirrored what Jesus did. Things like uh, the blind can see. Even he says here that Peter, they, they would bring the sick out. 
and, and put them in, in, in just so the shadow of Peter, which I think at times is, they're actually referencing the Holy Spirit, but um, it is, goes by these people and they are healed. They were gathering together like they always have and they were doing what God told them to do. And of course the Sanhedrin were also worried about them being accused of the death of Christ. And that was, it could be any of those things. It may be all of those things. But Peter is assuring them they're doing this only because God's telling them to do it. The authorities didn't like that answer. <laughs> the, the head of Sanhedrin, he wanted to kill them. But, you know, cooler heads prevailed. You know, there was a wise person there that said, hey, you know, there were these other uprisings that's happened to. And if these uprisings were from men, they'd disappear. And those, you know, when those guys died, it disappeared. So if this is from man, it will disappear. But if it's from God, then we can't stop it anyway, and it will continue on. They left the presence of the council here, okay, after being flogged. So they were beaten. And after being beaten, you think that's, again, pack our bags, let's go, let's get out of here. But we see in verse 41, when they left the presence of the council, they were rejoicing that they counted worthy of suffering dishonor in his name. Because being flogged was dishonorable. Being hung by the tree was a dishonorable thing looking back into the Old Testament that they put Jesus through. And, and verse 42 says, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. If you were to plot the activities of the followers of Jesus, you would see two things that Christ told them to do. To pray and to share the story of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. Which brings us to this question today. What is your priority? You at home right now, what is your priority? Do we check our priorities? The beginning of the year is good for us to stop and ask ourselves, am I giving a first-rate loyalty to the first-rate causes? What really is my priority in my life? Am I giving the best efforts for the best causes? First of all, are we doing the best causes? And the second of all, are we giving it our all? Are we giving it our first-rate efforts? Suppose we went to a restaurant. In my mind, I know this restaurant's closed now. I think of the 50-yard line, <laughs> okay? And you walked into the 50-yard line. I know I'm showing my age. You guys here in the front row are like, what was the 50-yard line? <laughs> yeah, Viv's right there right now. I have no idea. But it's a beautiful place. Okay, And if you guys were there back 20, 30, 40 years ago, you remember this. You walked to that door, and it looked like a classy place, a very classic place. They have all your uh, cloth um, tablecloths there, and the handkerchiefs all made in the nice little decorative shapes, and the candles and decorative pieces in the middle, and you know your silverware was all shined up, and I'm pretty sure it was real silver. And you had people that were just standing, waiting to do stuff. Waiting to do stuff. They're waiting to be, bring you the menu. They're waiting to bring you your water. They even had water ready pouring up right there because they're seeing you come through that door and stuff like that. And you're sitting down. They pull out the chair for you. And you're allowed to sit down and they push that chair. Isn't that awesome? Do you, do you men do that for your wives still? Huh? I'm guilty. I'm, I haven't done that in a while for my wife. She is shocked when I open the door for her. I tried to open the door for her a lot, but she's still shocked, like, is it date night? <laughs> you know? But let, let's, it has the right kind of atmosphere. And let's say all this is going on. Everything's going on like that. I mean, they're shining those things up. And everything's looking pretty and everything like that. And you're sitting there, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting. Well, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? They're awfully, I mean, they're obviously professional. They're impressive looking people. They're all groomed and they're all in uniform. You're waiting for that high. 
I'm Sue, and I'll be your waitress. You're waiting for that to happen. You're waiting for your food. You're waiting for your food. How about going out to a farm? And the farmer meets you at that gate, and he takes out his farmhouse, and he goes to the backyard where his barn is, and the barn, (coughs) sorry, the barn, you can tell he's proud of that thing. I mean, he opens up that door, and it doesn't even squeak because it's all oiled. Everything's beautiful like that. The, the paint is perfect. I mean, it has all those red things on all the boards and the white stripes across where the white stripes are supposed to be. You go inside and the hay bales are just laid perfectly. And you're lined up with all these machines that you have no idea what they do on both sides. But they're there and they're pristine. The chrome on them are just shining perfectly. And you can tell he's proud of that. He hops up on that tractor He hops up there, you know, he turns that on, and that engine, that diesel just purrs. And then he takes you over to the swaffer, what would be when I was growing up. You got a stripper, or maybe it's a a harvester, if you will, and he starts that up, and it's perfect. It's perfect. Sounds great and everything like that. You know, balers and everything else that we might be using. Balers, for you guys that are hay people, you used to baler, right? (laughs) Now, it's interesting that Josh is waving his head to all these things, like, you know, <laughs> where me and him, the only ones growing up on a farm when we were younger and stuff like that. Of course, he still does the farm stuff. But all that's there. A concrete floor that's perfect. It almost looks like it's brand new. And then you ask the farmer, hey, 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 how's the harvest? Harvest? What do you mean harvest? There's no harvesting here. I just work in this barn. It all sounds funny. It really does when we put in that light. In church, we do important things. In church, we build and maintain buildings. We teach morals. We teach people to do things and to do right. We sing songs and we worship as well, of praise and worship rather. We preach sermons, we talk about people who have gone to far enough, far away places that we can't even pronounce the name of those cities and countries. And we pray for them. And we give money and time to all these things. But I think we have to ask ourselves, are these important things the most important thing that we're doing? Are these important things the most important thing that we're doing? Jesus tells us the field is the world, and the people in the field are his harvest. It's good for that illustration of the waiters and waitresses. It's good for them to polish the silverware, fix all those napkins, straighten all those tables, light all those candles, stack up all those menus, make sure they're all clean, and and it's good for them to wear masks and everything, and, 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 and prepare for the people coming. But isn't the most important job for them to do is to bring you food? Why would we open up a restaurant that never gave you food? It wouldn't be a restaurant, would it? I mean, doesn't that violate the name of the restaurant? It really would. It's all important, but what about the food? What about the food? And that that farmer who maintained his tractor and painted his barn, made everything machine was working, and it, it was all in good working order, and everything was oiled, and everything was ready to go and stuff like that, those are all important things. If you neglect those things, they won't work. But why have them working if you're never going to go out and sow and harvest? Doesn't that neglect having a farm? Doesn't that not meet that, being a farmer? <laughs> Isn't the reason why you buy this $300,000 tractor <laughs> is so you can harvest in the stuff and sell it at least? Sell something, whether it's the product or whether the people, it's the livestock that eats the product that you sell the product. I mean, somewhere along the line, there's got to be an exchange of money for them to pay for that $300,000 tractor. I mean, really, there needs to be something happening. That's why we have a farm. That's why we have a crop. It's to take care of our family, to take care of that livelihood, right? It is good for the church to do a lot of good things. It's good for us to build our buildings. It shows what we believe in God and everyone around us lets them know that and, and, and provides a place for them to come and worship with us. 
uh, to pray and sing and train and do all these things and even have a place here for us to sit right now where it's not 14 degrees and a wind chill of negative four, we can sit in here and listen to this word. It's important things. Our Lord says, do you not understand? I sent you here to tell a very special story. I really don't like to say the word story. I really like to say the word truth. A very important truth. I sent you here to go into the world and tell them that I love them and I want them to have everlasting life in me. I want them to have everlasting life in me. So I ask you again, what is the church's first priority? Can you be honest with me right now? If someone were to stop you in the street at this moment, sometime today, that's something you want to get out in the ice and snow and everything. What is it that you really want to see your church do? What is it that you really want to see Red Bud do? What is the most important thing that you want to do as a Christian and as a group of Christians? What is the most important thing? What do you want to see happen? What should the church be doing? And some of you guys are really kind, benevolent. You have a tender heart, and you might say this. Well, meeting the needs, meeting needs is the church's priority. And there are a lot of needs for food, and that is good that we meet that need. There's a lot of needs for clothes, and it's important that we meet those needs. Shelter, that's, that's sort of important right now, isn't it? To have a home that you can go to where you can stay warm and out of the weather, that's important if we can meet the needs of people needing shelter. That should be a priority, and that's good. That's right. But the most important thing we need, the most focused attention we need to have on with our fellowship of believers, what is that most important thing? What is the main reason the church exists? Why does the restaurant exist so that people can eat food? Why does the farm exist so it can sow and harvest a crop? Why does the church exist? And someone might say the church really ought to be about strengthening families. And that's a great thing. That's a great need in our society. If you're going to point to one thing that seems to be breaking down and causing as much as we're seeing in the world today, it's the breakdown of the family. It really is. That's the greatest need, I think, in America right now, is families to be strengthened. But is this the major thrust of the church? Someone else might say we are to teach morals. We got to get back into the church and teach morality. We got to teach what right living is. We need to say that some things are forever right. And there are some things in this world that are forever wrong. And we need to know what those are. And there is no gray lines between what's right and what's wrong. There was a, a French man that came and visited. This is, oh gosh, this is probably 60 years ago. Might have been 70. And, and he came to America to find out why this country was so strong and so great. And he said this, America is great because America is good. And he also said this, when America stops being good, America will stop being great. And we're seeing some of that today. We're seeing some of this, we're losing that, that good. So we're definitely losing what's great about being America. And your freedom... It, 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 you know, you have a freedom to make choices here in America. And that freedom allows you to make right choices and wrong choices. But when you make wrong choices, you're going to lose that freedom. The real reason for us to exist, for that real reason, we need to look to Jesus for an example. Following the examples of Jesus, our Lord met people's needs. He did. I mean, the blind can see. 
But I need to ask you, were all the blind able to see? The lame could walk. Were all the lame in the world able to walk because of Jesus? He fed thousands and thousands. Did he feed every last one of them? Did he feed all the people that are hungry in the world? He met these physical needs as he went upon his traveling and his teaching. He had compassion on people, and he healed them as he was going along. But his greatest needs in the world, the greatest needs in this church, the greatest needs at every church, the greatest need right now are not physical needs, guys. They're spiritual needs. And Jesus knows that it was spiritual needs that he was there for. Our God, you know, Jesus, he believed in families. God invented family. It was his idea. He used family to illustrate the relationship that we have between Christ and his bride. Between the groom and the bride was between Christ and the church. He used family to demonstrate that. God, our Father, he gave us a father on earth physically to look at to give us an idea what this relationship should be between a father and a child and mothers and sisters and daughters and wives and husbands. They're all in the Bible. But when they're talking about these and giving instructions to these people and these families, he's talking to the Christians, the people that believe in him already and would follow his instructions, right? We always talk to people before getting married, and, and you know, I mean, we're going to be talking about groceries to graciousness, and we're going to be talking about conflicts and kisses as well. And we're going to be talking about taxes, but also tenderness. See, a marriage is really, man, it's like mixing silk and steel together. That's not to say the man's steel and the women's silk. I'm just saying they don't go together very well. Okay, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> the oil is going to flow on top of the water. Anyway, all that type of stuff. They won't mix very well. But if you put Christ in the middle of that, and these people are moving closer to Christ, then they move closer to each other. They move closer to each other. The thing that he's talking about in the Bible is families of believers. Families of believers. They have to be believers first for this to work. And only he can make the impossible work. And at times, at times marriage seems impossible, but following God makes marriage seem like it's simple. And, and let's talk about morality for a minute. You know, talked about family and good deeds and physical stuff. That's all the things we thought would be good things, right? Let's talk about moral values. And, and Christ came to earth, and, and he's, you know, these rules that you guys call Ten Commandments, you guys call them kind of like guidelines and stuff like that? Well, it's more than that. It's more than that. These are principles. Not only is it wrong to commit adultery, if you think about committing adultery, you already committed adultery. It's not just wrong to murder someone if you put someone down to put some type of superiority over them. You've already murdered them in your heart. He took the moral value to its perfect completeness to let you know just how immoral you really are. How immoral you really are. In fact, if we think about it, What's the only way we can be moral? If we're Christians, and I mean Christians, people that have faith in Christ, Jesus, and it's their Savior and Lord. Those are the people, and the only reason why they have any type of morality is the work of Christ in them, and them following His will in their life. So, 
all these things we see, and we still, what is the most important thing that the church can do? Are we, am I preaching, and there's no one listening? Was Shane and Warren singing, and no one worshiping? I know Louise and them work with the children back here in the preschool, and Sylvia worked with the children over there, and Shane works with the youth, and we have our adult teachers, and I love every last one of them. And imagine coming to a church where those are the only people that are there, and they're just standing there. They got the Bible. They got the Explore the Bible lesson plan, gospel project all ready to go. We have all the games planned out in here. We have all the games over there. Gershom and, and Shane have worked together all the music, and they're ready to go. Warren with them as well. And the pastor, Carlos, he's got the message, and he's ready to preach it all. And there is no one getting any of that because they're not doing what they're saying they're supposed to be doing. And not only that, not even the people that were in the congregation. See, our most important thing is spreading the gospel message. Even Christ... They, they lowered the man through the ceiling, guys. He could not walk in there to listen to Christ and what his message was. He could not go in there and his friends lower him to the ceiling. So you think the first thing, his most need, his need must be to walk again. But what did Christ say to him? Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And then... And this wasn't because the guy there has his sins forgiven, okay? It's because of the unbelievers that are out in the audience right then. And those Pharisees and Sadducees and everybody else that, that didn't think he was the Messiah. And they're saying, oh, blasphemy, because he's preaching, or he's saying your sins are forgiven. Only God can forgive sins. He's the only one that has that right. But to prove to you doubters that I have that right, get up, grab your, grab your bed, and walk out. Because only God would have the strength to heal people, too, and that power. But the most important thing was his sins forgiven. It would be better for us to be crawling into heaven because we can't walk than it would be able to walk into hell because we never had our sins forgiven. That's what's better and that's why the church is here, guys. Our most important priority. We can even go to the deacons. Not our deacons necessarily. <laughs> Any deacons out there. But when they pick the deacons. Why did they pick the deacons? Because someone was bringing up the fact that the widows weren't being taken care of. And, and, and the, the apostles and, and the leaders get together and say, hey, we need to gather together these men to take care of all these ministries because we have to keep preaching the message that Christ told us to do. It's not saying that taking care of widows wasn't important. They were. It is. But we can't do that in place of giving the message. Even the widows need to have the message of Christ given to them. Even those that are starving need to have the message of Christ given to them. Even those who need shelter needs to have the message of Christ. And they all need that because this world will end and any misery that we have in this world caused by whatever's going on will be gone. And then what's left? What's left is spiritual, everlasting. What's left is what we have in Christ, and that is in a relationship with Him, that He will put us in peace with God again, put us together with God again. So I'm asking you today, what's the most important thing? of this church. Do we need to be like that restaurant, sitting there and waiting and doing everything we're supposed to do except the most important part? This year, do we need to be looking at what's the most important thing for us to be doing as believers in Christ Jesus who trust Him as our Savior? What's the most important thing for us to do? And He told us. And He showed us. That's to be spreading the gospel message to everyone. The pastor says, pray. 
And we need to pray. We need to pray for direction. We need to pray for God to cover everything that He needs to be covering so we can continue to do God's will here, that we can continue to be His hand here on earth, and we can continue to do the most important thing, and that's to evangelize the lost. We're a going church first because we need to be going to get people the message of Christ, the good news. And then we're, yeah, we're growing church, you know, at that point. And we're not talking numbers. We're talking about disciples. We're talking about bringing people along board and teaching them everything that God commanded, just like the Great Commission tells us to do. And we're going to do that and grow, grow them in Christ so they can turn around and reach other with the gospel message. And he told us to do all that. So I'm asking you again, what is your priority this year? Who are you looking to? Because if we're looking to just, just singing, you know, just preaching, just doing our Bible study, meeting together for a Bible study, just having our, our rooms back here for the teaching, and I'm the minister of education. Okay, I want us to have Sunday school rooms for teaching, believe me. I'm trying to find places. You guys want to meet in this closet? Because, you know, you know, if we get to that short space, we're going to be in this closet because we need a place to meet. The fellowships and everything else that we have. If we do only that and never evangelize the lost, not just Red Bud, but every church, then eventually there's no one to disciple. There's no one to sing with you. There's no one to preach to. There's no one to feed, actually. There's no one left doing that stuff because we never reached them for the gospel. They never had a chance to know Christ as their Savior. There's no reason for this church to exist because we're not doing the primary thing that God told us and Christ showed us that we need to do, and that's to spread the gospel message. So I'm asking you today, this priority that we have, are you going to give your most to that priority? Is there people around you today that you need to reach tomorrow at your work? People that you need to talk to about Christ. It says here that the, the apostles went from door to door to door. Every chance they got, teaching in the temple, every place they met, and they were talking about Christ the the gospel, what he did on the cross for them, how he was God coming to earth, and he died on the cross for our sins. And on the third day, he rose again, and that he is our Savior and Lord. And sometimes we get too far in the Savior, and we forget all about the Lord part. Because the Savior part's easy. Savior part's easy. I trust you as my Savior. That's right. Now I'm going to come to church and I'm going to fill this pew and come here every once in a while, Easter and Mother Day and, and stuff like that. Yeah, he's my Savior. But as Lord, is he not telling you to this thing that you have in your heart, this thing that you know, are you not supposed to be telling other people about that? Are you not supposed to be gathering together so you can learn more, so you can take that and teach it to others. James tells us we need to be doers of the word, not me, the writer in the book of James. Doers of the word, not just readers of the word. If we just read the Bible and that's all we're doing, oh man, let's open up our new Bible and we're going, that we got for Christmas and we're going to do that new study for this year that's going to go all the way through the Bible and we're going to read all the way through the Bible and we get to the end of the year and we put it on Facebook and oh my gosh, I have read this whole Bible. Woohoo! and we did nothing at all, then his word is worthless because his word tells us what we need to do. We need to love everyone. And in that love, we need to give everybody the gospel message. We need to go out of our comfort zone here. And he's not talking about preachers alone. He's not talking about evangelists alone. He's not talking about people that came out of the seminary. He's not talking about a TV evangelist. He's not talking about people with doctorates. He is talking about every last one of us in this pew. If we know Christ is our Savior, we need to be giving his word to everyone around us. Not only do we need to be showing him by the way we follow him as Lord in our life, we need to be giving them the gospel message clearly. 
Christ died for you. Christ is your Savior. He's the only one that when everything on this world and everything in this world will die and crumble and turn to dust except for what Christ promised spiritually and everlasting, which is our love for Him and our trust in Him as our Savior and Lord. Now, as we come to this, guys, the end of this, whew, we have a new year to start thinking about this. And we have a new year to start acting on this. I think we've been thinking about it enough. It's time to start acting. And acting, I mean by action, not pretending. Okay? And guys, so you need to look at right now in your life and say, what am I going to have to move and change and make a priority? Because I hear all the excuses all the time. We have all these excuses of things more important. And I always believed if you get too busy for the Lord, you're too busy, period. Take those things off your priority list. Yes, NCIS is a pretty cool thing to watch. Okay, you've seen that one 14 times. Isn't it about time you just kind of turn the TV off? <laughs> Maybe we need to turn the TV off anyway. There's so much junk on it right now. And that includes everything that we've been hearing about news and stuff like that. And Maybe it's time for us to do what God commanded us to do in the first place. Go into all the nations. Teaching them all that I commanded. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And surely I'll be with you to the end of the age. So, you may be sitting there right now. You're saying, I need to make a decision to make this a priority in my life, to reach people for Christ. But there may be people in this audience right now that are saying, what do you mean, faith in Jesus, that he's my Savior and Lord? I mean that Christ came to earth to become our sacrifice. A perfect person. Perfect for God, His Son, God in flesh. And He died on the cross, yes, by our hand. To do what? To cover our sins. To cover that separation we have with God because we cannot cover that ourselves. And on the third day, He rose from, from the grave. And he's right there in heaven right now with God. And if you trust him as your Savior, your spiritual, internal, everything about you and why you're here is going to be taken care of eternally and spiritually. I'm not talking about physically. If you're blind when you walk in here. You may be blind when you walk out of here. And praise the Lord, if you're not, that's a miracle and everything like that. That's awesome. But more importantly, if you walk in here lost and not knowing Christ, you need to walk out of here knowing Christ. And that's the most important thing. That's what this whole conversation has been about. And this is something that can be simple. The prayer is simple, but the prayer is not magic. It's you turning from your sin, looking to your Savior and saying, you are the Messiah are my Savior and Lord and I have faith that you covered my sins and now you are Lord of my life. So we're going to pray that prayer just here in a minute. So if you want to make that decision today, you follow me in this prayer. And then I'll have another prayer for those of you who run rededicate yourself to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I am a sinner. If it was up to me to make my way straight to God again, it would never happen. So I turn from my sins today, Lord. And I trust You that You went to the cross and You bore my sins and You took my penalty upon You. And Lord, You died there on that cross as my sacrifice, my substitute. And Lord, I trust You today as my Savior and Lord. Never to deny that again never to turn away from that again. Faithfully, I trust you as my Savior and Lord. For it's Jesus' name that I pray this. Amen.
And Lord, as we continue to call on you, Lord, I may be, Lord, saved. I know you. But Lord, I have made your priority my priority. And this year, Lord, and the rest of my life, I want your priority to be my priority. And Lord, I give up all that other stuff right now. Everything else that's distracting me and confusing me and keeping me, no matter how good it is, it's not the greatest thing that you want me to do. And the thing that I need to have my most focus on. So Lord, I am seeking your will in my life today. And I'm going to follow you today and forever. Whatever you tell me to do through the Spirit, I will follow you in your strength to do. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you made either one of those decisions today, online, you can call, or not call, you can call me if you want, that's fine. You can call the church, we'll talk about it. But you can text live to 806-329-3030. Just say, I made a decision, and here's what it is. Let us celebrate with you. Let us pray with you. If there's a, a question you have, let us have a chance to answer that question through the Spirit. Give us that chance. 806-329-3030. If you text life, it'll put you into an automatic system of things going on. But if you don't text life, that's okay too. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to open up the app and I'm going to answer anything that you have right now. Please, don't hesitate. And Lord, I mean, guys, right now, if you made that decision out there in the audience right now, in the sanctuary, I'm going to be down here. If you made a decision, come talk to me about it. Come tell me what you decide to do. If it's Christ is your Savior, we're going to pray about that, and we're going to celebrate that. And as if it's you turning back to doing what the Lord wants you to live like, we're going to pray about that, and we're going to celebrate that too. But don't leave here without knowing Christ as your Lord. Please, let this be the last moment. I'll be down here. If you have a decision to make, please come up here.